uh, some exercises for you people to do. Has anyone tried these exercises? Uh, so let me ask the first one. Has anyone tried using the conservation of stress, conservation of the stress tensor, using the fact we have uh, del z bar t z z bar, del w bar t w w bar is equal to del z del w of t z from del z z bar del w bar of t z z t is anyone trying to use this relationship to pull out uh, T alpha alpha is equal to zero is equal to Has anyone done this and got the constant? Uh, did you get the right answer? Was there a minus? Anyone else? Okay, uh, I won't ask you to repeat. Minus. Minus. But okay, that's that, uh, let's check if there is a minus sign. I think there is. Uh, we, we'll go through it in a moment. But uh, okay, I won't ask you to come to the board. That just take too much time. Uh, but okay, okay. So Jyoti Ma's time. Jyoti Ma is time. What about the second exercise, which is computing the matrix of? Uh, uh, that comes out to be something like c by two zero zero zero. So zero zero zero. zero. If you con con consider it on, it on the back. On the back, you Yeah, otherwise it's, it's some complicated H and H square. Exactly, exactly. So, so already that is sufficient to tell you. Because there will be a vacuum always oh, and this has to be greater than 0 that C has to be. Very good. So, uh, so Jyoti Boy gave the answer. Um, I, <coughs> when, when I did the calculation for, for the most general thing, by the way, I got the following. And the most general matrix I got the following. I got uh, 4H plus C by 2. Uh, 4H into H with 2H plus 1. Uh, 2H plus 1. Uh, that's the matrix of uh, uh, your product. Okay? Um, I, I, as Jyoti Mai says, all you need to know to get the result, C must be greater than zero for unitarity. All you need to do is apply this to the special case of the identity of the vacuum, uh, in which case uh, uh, the positivity of C is simply the positivity of this matrix. Okay? Uh, but uh, this general result from a general operator will also be useful later on okay? uh, in determining, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, negative norm states. It's a sort of interesting exercise to compute the determinant of this, uh, of this matrix. Okay? I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do. I'll just give you the answer. Uh, uh, the answer turns out to be, suppose you compute the determinant of this. Uh, oh, sorry, I got this was 6H, this was 6H. And this was 4H. Okay, if you compute the determinant of this matrix, you get the following answer. You get uh, uh, get tangent is equal to H minus H1, H minus H1 into H minus H2 into H minus H3, where H1 is equal to 0. H2 is equal to H2 and H3 are equal to 16 into 5 minus C plus minus plus uh, 1 by 16 into square root of 1 minus C into 25 minus C. Okay, it's just solving for some quadratic equation. It becomes a quadratic equation because you get a factor of H immediately outside, so then it's quadratic. So you can factorize this expression for the, 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 the determinant. The important point is that you see that certain values of, uh, uh, you see for instance, that the determinant is not always positive. Okay, you've got these two different values, okay, and if you're in between these, if H is in between H, H2 and H3, H is greater than 0, let's say, okay, 
But in between H2 and H3, okay, then the dominant would go negative. Right? Because it's a product of, uh, uh, of three factors, two of which are positive and one which is negative. If the determinant's negative, it's impossible to the, for all eigenvalues of the matrix to be positive. Okay? So this tells this already gives you some restriction based on unitarity on the operator content of a theory. Okay, with central charge C. Okay, um, you know, <coughs> a, 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 you see, we're getting restrictions saying that the that the H of the theory cannot lie in a certain range depending on what C is. But this constraint is there only if the square root is. Uh, this constraint is there only if the square root is uh, uh, not an imaginary number. Exactly. So it's um, so that also tells you that. So, for instance, um, now have I got this? Yeah. So, if C is less than one, or if C is greater than, uh, if C is right, no, it's just just if C is less than one, then that that condition that Logan Adler pointed out is is, is met. Okay. This is some positive real number. So when the C is less than one, you find that you find four models for which C is less than one, you find this constraint. Okay? Given a value of C, already the simple calculation still does that you can't that not all values of scaling dimensions of primary operators are allowed. Okay? There's some some restriction. Now, this is the restriction that we got from level two. You could try to do the same calculation in level three. And so, oh, Okay, and tr try to satisfy all all constraints that come from unitarity. Okay, and if you go ahead and do that, you find uh, though I don't think in this class we'll actually go through this this calculation. But if you go ahead and do that, it turns out that you find that when c is less than one, unitarity severely constrains uh, severely constrains the possibilities. It turns out that. You can, you can have unitary theories or if and only if C takes one of a set of discrete values, an infinite set of discrete values. And then given a, a, that particular value of C, the possible allowed values of H in that theory are some finite double values. Okay? So uh, uh, there's a set of two integers in terms of which uh, all the values of C that are less than one, that are consistent with unitarity, are parametrized. And given that particular, those particular set of integers, the range of possible H's with some other parameter, which runs over a finite set of values, is also specified. So just unitarity in a conformal field theory with central charge less than one tells you a great deal about the structure. It tells you that the central charge can't be anything, it has to be one of the discrete set of values. It tells you once you know the central charge, the, oper uh, the operator, uh, the operator uh, scaling dimensions can't be anything, then to take one of a finite number of values. Okay? So, uh, uh, unitarity gives you important constraints on uh, uh, the physics of, uh, of conformity in theory with C less than 1. Um, uh, now, all, all of these, the, the, also, then for every value of central charge allowed by this unitarity analysis, there exists at least one conform well, probably exactly, but anyway, there exists at least one conformal field theory. Uh, these have been constructed by direct construction. Okay? With that value of the central charge and with some of these operators. These, these central charge uh, these, these theories are called the minimal models. And and it turns out that these values of that that all you see. Not every operator is allowed in these things. Only operators with very distinguished, uh, with very distinguished uh, um, uh, scaling dimensions. Now, the reason we can't have every scaling dimension in the game is that if you move the scaling dimension a little bit, the norm of some state will go negative. If that's going to happen, it must have been that the norm of some state was zero at the distinguished values of the of H. That is indeed, indeed the case. So, uh, so these minimal models are models in which you have uh, the representation theory has some null states. Uh, because of which, for the reasons we talked about in the last class, you can write down differential equations that 
help constrain uh, uh, help constrain the behavior of correlation functions, and essentially solve for these problems. Okay, so uh, uh, although this is not the, none of what I said is going to be terribly uh, important for the direct line of attack of our class, okay, um, uh, it, it's an interesting an interesting point that minimal model that conformal field theories with C less than one are completely classified. And essentially all solved. You know, if any conformal field theory in two dimensions with center charge is the one, you've got complete classification, you're going to be more or less in solution. And this illustrates the power of these techniques. What other you know, you can't generally solve for a quantum field theory. In these cases, you can. By solve, I mean you can give this, I mean find the full operator spectrum, find all correlation functions. Okay, so this was a comment I wanted to make about uh, uh, about this. Uh, uh, about this norm calculation. Okay, uh, if you want to read a little more about this, this kind of stuff, these lecture notes by Ginsburg called applying the formal field. Uh, I'll do a I think the Lizouge lecture, though it's from 1988. Then they're a good source to start the WP references. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about this, 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 this first thing. Now let's quickly go through the second calculation. What is that zero of the H1 is G? The state is Can anyone tell me why there has to be an H in this formula? What is zero? It's the uh, common taking value. Okay, so the idea follows from calculation. But is there a more structural way of understanding this? Uh, is, is it a simple way to understand this fact? Is that at level of one, we did the calculation of norms of states. And we found that the norm was equal to H. Okay, now, suppose we have a, a state with zero norm at level 1. That implies the existence of a state with zero norm at level 2. Because you take that level 1 state and act with it, act on it with some, with some, uh, uh, some basic operator. Okay, now you do the norm calculation for that, that other state, that would relate the norm of this new state to the norm of the level 1 state with zero. Okay, so you get some number times zero, and therefore zero. Okay, so this is a general fact that any state that is a descendant of a state with zero norm will also have zero. Okay, so since at h equals zero, there was a level one le uh, state with zero norm at level one, there must be at least one state with zero norm at level two, at level two, the descendants of that zero norm state. Okay, uh, this would be a general fact about this. This, this determinant, by the way, has a name. Determinant of all uh, of, no, of inner products of states at level n has a name. It's called the Karch determinant. Uh, and Karch is given an explicit formula for this determinant at every uh, case. Case. Uh, has given an explicit formula for this determinant at, at every level, which is what, what is used to uh, give the analysis of uh, allowed values of central charge and allowed values of. Uh, uh, Scaling dimensions of operators that I mentioned. Okay, so this was a bit of a diversion, but uh, uh, about something quite interesting uh, about one uh, conformity theory. It will not form the heart of what we talk about when we send this theory. Okay, good. So now let's get back to the second exercise. So let's do the second exercise. So the second exercise was, was this thing. Um, let's see. So, We have this nice equation which tells us that del z of tz z bar times del w of tw w r is equal to del z bar del w bar of tz z tw w. Okay. Now, so suppose I call 
Suppose I define T Z Z bar T W W bar and define that as F. Then I compute it to del Z del W of F. F is a function of uh, you know, Z W. Then I compute it to del W to del Z del W of F is equal to del Z bar Z W bar of C by two of the Z minus W of Right? Now, let me rewrite this quantity in terms of one z and one w derivative of something. Okay? So I can rewrite that as um, um, as del w del z, del z bar del w bar of 1 over z minus w, the whole thing squared, except that I need. Um, the fa an additional factor of 2 times 3 um, and a minus sign because one of when I differentiate I get 2 minus sign but the third one because one of these is like W and the other one just like Z ok so, so the final answer is equal to minus C by 12 Is this clear? Okay? Now we integrate both, right? Don't worry too much about what I get uh, as constants of integration. So f, this tells me that f is minus c by 12 times del z bar del w bar of 1 over z minus w you know, in squared. Now, in, in two dimensions, 
I will declare the del square of log of r is equal to 2 pi times the delta function. How do I know this? Well, I know this using Stokes, the Stokes theorem. You see, because del of log r is equal to r hat divided by r. Therefore, integral del log r over a circle is equal to pi. Okay? But that must be the same as the volume integral of del square log r over the over plane. Okay? Which tells me that del square log r must be 2 pi times the delta. Okay? Yeah, of course it's easy to check that del square log r is zero everywhere perhaps except perhaps at r equal zero. But there's a singularity there, as you see from this application of the source. Okay? So this this formula can be written as T set Z of uh, T alpha alpha of Z, T beta beta uh, of W is equal to minus C by six uh, del squared um, uh, minus C by six del squared of the delta function. Uh, you uh, I, I got a tangent of question line. Uh, Uh, I, I made 12, 6 because this was R squared right? and this relation has been to R You might argue with minus signs from the fact that some of the derivatives are Z derivatives and some of them are W derivatives. But we always have two derivatives. It's even number of derivatives. So there's no issues. Okay? So we've concluded that this equation is true. Okay. Now, what does that tell us? What does that tell us about uh, the trace the stress tensor uh, in a, on an arbitrary curve, on an arbitrary manner? Okay. Well, uh, what, what, what do we get? You see, you remember, as I reminded you last time, um, the change, go, the change in T alpha alpha was equal to minus 1 by 4 pi times the integral of 2 omega, let's say, x. And T alpha alpha x, T beta beta, y, let's call this of x, uh, of y. D2y. But this was the change uh, the change in the value of uh, uh, d alpha alpha x under eta goes to e, e to the power 2 omega. Okay? Uh, and this is so correct. This followed from the, the, the definition of our stress tensor and you know what the change in the metric was under this, this small change, this small conformal transformation. Fine. So now let's use our our, our, our formula for the um, our formula for uh, the two point function of the stress tensor. Okay? So we get the uh, del squared of a uh, of a delta function, integrate by parts, have the uh, uh, del squared act on the other side. Uh, on the omegas, so we, uh, so we finally <coughs> get um, uh, the change of t alpha alpha x is equal to um, uh, uh, the, the change of t alpha alpha of x is equal to um, Is equal to so the two pi cancel. This is a, so we get uh, c by six times the square of omega. Okay. Get confused with whether there's a minus. Uh, 
I made a request to the way to next the Tiago uh, Milkea, where there's a minus sign. Uh, I'll give you the final answer though, which is okay. I think I missed, missed the minus sign somewhere. <laughs> okay, sorry. But, okay, so now, uh, now what? You see, but, but we have that, uh, we, we had some general considerations. We had some general considerations that the alpha alpha was equal to some number a times alpha. Now, we know how the alpha alpha changes under a change in, in a conformal transformation. So all we have to do is to see how, how the right hand side changes under a change in the conformal uh, transformation. Okay? And it's easy to check that this, uh, this thing changes by A times del square of 2. Okay, this is a standard formula that you pull out of and D So you work out. Okay, so comparing these two, comparing these two, we say that uh, A has to be equal to C by 12. Unfortunately, we'll just get a minus C by 12. So I've uh, missed a minus sign somewhere. Uh, hey, let's not try to track down the minus sign here. Just waste time. We do. I'll get it through the next class. It's not worth the time. I'm sure we can do it in 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, I'll track down the minus sign carefully next time. Sorry, sorry for that. But up to the minus sign, we've got this answer. Okay. Now, um, okay. So we've concluded, uh, although we concluded with minus sign wrong, that t alpha alpha is equal to minus c by twelve. Uh, okay. This is a, a, a completely universal result. It's universal in the sense that the only thing about the conformal field theory that it depends on is the central charge. By the way, uh, all we used here is the left moving central charge. We used the quantity that appears in the operator product expansion of T with T, left moving central. But we could have done the same calculation with the right moving central. So we would get the same answer, of course. So if the left moving central charge of our theory was not equal to the right moving central charge of our theory, then something is wrong. Right? Because we, we do a calculation and we get one answer from the left moving central charge. Do another calculation, we get another answer from the right moving central charge. So this, this, this conclusion is correct. Actually, you see, the, the thing that we've used importantly all over the place, assumed importantly is we maintain diffeomorphism in variance. So what we see is that while you know there's nothing wrong with the conformal field theory just in flat space with left moving and right moving central charges different. However, if you want the theory to be diffeomorphically invariant, that is you want to be able to define it in a diffeomorphically invariant way on an arbitrary manifold, uh, the only way that can be done is that the left moving and right moving central charge is like Okay? Theories with different left moving, right moving central charges is what have what, what is called a diffeomorphism or sometimes a gravitational anomaly. Okay? And that anomaly is simply the statement that it's not consistently possible to lift, you know, if something could break down if you try to lift the theory to an arbitrary, you know, arbitrary space that's not arbitrary space. Okay? Um, now, uh, I want to point out one, one, one consequence of this fact. A consequence of the fact that the trace distress tends to determine just when central charge shows. That's good. Okay. Um, uh, uh, 
that. Okay. This statement is more powerful than you might first think. It's more powerful than you might first think for the following reasons. Suppose you had <laughs> Suppose you were interested in conformity theories when the metric G alpha beta is equal to eta alpha beta times eta alpha beta. Okay? Now, under a small change in phi, you can compute how the partition function of this theory changes. Because under the small change in phi, the change in the partition function is going to be proportional to the trace of the stress tensor in that theory times the change in phi with some proportionality factor that we you have to carefully keep track as all these minus 4 pi and so on in these seasons. This is clear, that's why the definition of the stress is. But we already know what the, what the, uh, the trace is in terms of as a function of phi. Okay? So we get an equation of the form with some constants that you keep track of. Delta z is proportional to integral delta phi times minus c by times okay, I'm not even talking about constant size of r, where r itself can easily be written down in terms of phi. So you've got functional differential equation, okay, which is actually possible quite easily, it's possible quite easily sum of this. Okay? Um, I, 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 want you to be, I want you to do this as an exercise. Exercise show that z is equal to you know, some number which you determine times phi del squared. So z is equal to e to the power some number that you will determine times phi del squared phi. Solves the function differential equation that you get from uh, from this. Times z phi. Times z phi equals zero, which you treat as a number. Yeah, times exactly. That is related by wire reasoning to flat space. Okay, but now suppose we consider an arbitrary metric by a few moments of invariance up to possible discrete global problems. We've already used the statement that we can always put use the few moments of invariance to put the metric into such such a form. So if we maintain the few moments of invariance as we've always been doing. That this information is enough to determine the partition function for the theory of an arbitrary map. You see, not just a manifold that is conformally related to flat space, because every manifold is related by conformal plus a different map morphism transform into flat space up to some global. Then, therefore, all we have to do is to search for a covariant expression that reduces to this expression. For metrics of that form. And you're done. Uh, so, this, this is part one. The part two of the exercise is to show that, Z is, that the covariant expression is Z is equal to e to the plus another number times R1 by L squared. And then there's the right square root G. The basic point is that R is dead squared phi. Once you take the bar, right? That is essentially R del square phi, so that uh, del square phi, one by del square phi, del square phi is this. You know, it's some, some numerical numbers. So, this number, of course, de is determined by the central charge. Which central charge? But either they are moving on the right moving central charge. All of these manipulations only make sense in the theorem in, in which both are equal. Okay? And this is, uh, you see what we've concluded. We see that we've got, <coughs> we've been, what we've concluded is that we have uh, incredibly, incredible power 
in these two dimensions, the form of these theories, uh, if you know the central charge of the theory, and you know the partition function of the theory in flat space, you know the partition function of the theory of any arbitrary man function. Okay? It's the difference between these two partition functions is just a fact that it depends only on the central charge of the theory. Hey, isn't this quite incredible? I mean, it's just such a simple manipulation gives you such powerful results. Okay? So this is the this is part of an answer, part of the answer to the question, why is the central charge important? Okay. Now, um, there's one other calculation that I want to outline for you. Um, one other calculation I want to outline for you that that says the same thing but in different words. And in words that uh, you may find physically more, uh, more appealing. Okay. Uh, I, want, I, I want again to, to, re, to re-derive the statement that the trace of t is minus c by 12 times r, uh, but from another point of view. It's the same point of view, right? Which is well, a slightly different point of view. Okay. And this point of view is the following. Under a conformal transformation, we know how the stress tests are transformed. As we are saying, the, 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 the transformation for analytic uh, epsilons is given by delta t is equal to the pole in epsilon of z times z. The residue of the pole is this. Okay? And uh, if epsilon is, uh, is analytic, we've seen that there are three terms in the, in the, the residue of the pole. There's uh, 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 there's epsilon uh, prime of z. There's, uh, there's epsilon prime of z times uh, 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 delta. There's uh, uh, plus two epsilon. Uh, how does it go? Sorry. Sorry. Epsilon of z times delta plus 2 epsilon prime of z times t and then there's plus uh, maybe I should just do it sorry okay so uh, okay so let's let's look at look at the so we have epsilon of z times times 1 uh, c by 2 z minus w to the 4 plus 2t of uh, w uh, z minus w squared plus delta uh, uh, of w z minus w. Okay, we want the residue of the pole here. So we get uh, uh, delta of w uh, plus the determinant of the first term of the data series expansion here. So that's plus 2t of w okay, times epsilon prime of 0 and w. Let's say w is 0. That's okay. And then plus we get uh, the term that has 3 powers of z minus w. Yeah. So we get epsilon triple prime at w by 6. So that's c by 12. c by 12 times. Uh, and not and I get and this one has it. Okay. Now these two terms, we understand what they mean. They're simply the transformations of T under the coordinate change that was part of the conformal transformation. Okay? This is just a tensorial behavior of the stress test. However, a conformal transformation is not just a coordinate change. It's a coordinates change plus a wide scale. This is a wide scale by what? See, if we make the transformation z is equal to z prime plus epsilon of z, <coughs> then the new type trait e to the power to first order epsilon prime of z prime plus epsilon z bar times dz prime dz bar prime. 
So the coordinate chain changes the metric length. Is in order to get the forward transformation, that is, to get the metric back to the flat space in the new coordinates, we have to perform a wire transformation with minus of this factor. Okay? So conformal transformation is the sum of coordinate change plus y transformation. The y transformation needed in this case is that we need to the power minus epsilon prime of z plus epsilon bar prime of z bar. Okay? So this third term here must represent the change in the stress tensor under the wire transformation. Okay? So, now let us try to rewrite what that change in the stress tensor under the wire transformation is in terms of the wire factor in a more invariant way. Okay? So the wire factor was down here. Uh, so this twice the wire factor was equal to uh, epsilon prime so this change which is triple derivative of uh, of this thing here tells us that change in tzz under y transformation you can write this as minus c by 12 times del z del z del z cube ah no well let's call it del z squared of del z of epsilon which is the same thing as del z squared of 2 omega Because this part is anti analytic and so it's killed by the solution of this. Okay, so although we know how the stress tensor transforms under only very specific kinds of wire transformations, it's easy to guess a general formula, which would be valid by any wire transformation, that reduces the stress tensor. Okay, then that's the formula. Right, because if this was the right arm formula, then you plug in this thing for the special case of W equals this, you get the right arm. Yeah, and then it has to be something, you know, that depends only locally on the y factor and so on. See, so I thought about trying to do it carefully, you can probably argue that this is enough information you need to fix this. Okay, that's great. But, uh, uh, but, uh, now we use. Uh, we use uh, 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 we use a uh, uh, coordinate uh, diffeomorphism invariants. Okay, uh, we use diffeomorphism invariants so that the equation that T Z Z del Z bar is equal to del Z of T Z Z bar. Uh, with the minus sign. Uh, with the minus sign and uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so let's let's do, uh, let's put a del z bar here. So I put a del z bar here. So that tells me what the change in del z del this thing is. I cancel one del z by by uh, uh, by uh, integration. So the, the final conclusion is that the del that delta of tzz bar is equal to uh, again I the minus sign. Anyway, I'll clear up both the minus signs. Okay, there's c by twelve times. Uh, it must have been wrong in this. You know whether we want to minus this or plus this. So it looks like okay. So uh, this is delta z delta z bar of uh, uh, delta z delta z bar of two w. Okay, but then once again raising indices, this is T alpha alpha is equal to C by 12 times del squared of 2W. But this is how the curvature gets changes. Okay, so that tells you that T alpha alpha 
if the alpha alpha is form A R A is C by 12, again I see from the to minus sign, I wonder if I got I will clear out these minus signs. There's some minus sign problem I have in my head, which I'll clear out for next class. I'm working consistently and getting positive. I must be doing something consistently wrong. So, okay. So once again, we check the conclusion that is equal to C by 12. Okay. Uh, the the nice thing about this derivation, the nice thing about this derivation is that uh, uh, it makes itself really clear what this anomalous term, what this anomalous term in the stress tensor transformation is. Uh, it's not a mystery. It's simply the transformation of T under a while transformation. Okay, and is linked to the fact that the trace of stress tensors. Okay, good. The last thing I want to say about this, 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 this reasoning about uh, about, about this stuff uh, is something I should have started with, but uh, but didn't because I think we were at the end of the class and then forgot. Was this equation? You see, we keep saying. That T alpha alpha is equal to A times R, and then we try to determine the value of A. But how do we know that this is the right form for T alpha? You know, why couldn't it be something else? Listen, so can anyone help me with the argument? Can anyone come up with a general argument that says that? Then, anyway, so the first thing we know is that T alpha alpha is equal to 0 in fact. Then next, what else? Could T alpha alpha depend on the state of the theory? Well, actually we've been doing it for expectation value, but this is the strongest statement. It's actually a statement of an operator statement. T alpha alpha is this. The answer is no. Because you see this, the theory is T alpha alpha classically is zero. So quantum mechanically, the way you get some non-zero value for T alpha alpha is from regulating the theory. Some measure effect which comes from short distance singularities. That is always insensitive in any quantum it is insensitive to the state of the theory. You know, something that happens at very short distances okay, is determined just by effectively the vacuum structure. So every finite energy state is like a vacuum at extremely short distance. Okay? So it's some effect that comes from uh, some careful regulation, happens at very short distances, cannot depend on the state of the theory. Okay, so the so what we have in our hat, it could depend on some parameter of the theory, and it could depend on the metric. Now we are in the conformity theory. So there are no if there are, it depends on the parameters of the theory, it doesn't depend on some parameter, it depends on central much. But if it depends on some parameter of the theory, that parameter, whatever it is, cannot have any dimensions. This is the theory, it's conformed. Okay, so we have to make up our dimensions from derivatives of the metric. Now, uh, what can we get? This thing here is dimension 2. So we want some scale here on the right hand side that has dimension 2. What could it be? It's the metric. No, it's the it's the the, the curvature statement. Basically, there's no other candidate. You might say, well, suppose it didn't have dimension two. You say, you might say, well, okay, you're telling me that everything here has come from short distance effects. Okay. So suppose what we got was not something with dimension two, but dimension, let's say, four, and it's made up by some power of the short distance regulator. Okay, that's possible, and indeed, if you do a calculation in which you regulate it, that will be true. You get some contribution to the trace of the stress, uh, the trace of the stress tensor, let's say r to the four. But that is now mass dimension four, so it comes with an explicit distance cut off square. Then, when you take the continuum, nothing matters. Okay, uh, so basically, the, the uh, you, you you might ask, what about something with dimension one to zero? Well, there is no covariant scalar with dimension 1 or 0 that doesn't, well, there's just no covariant scalar with dimension 1 or 0. Okay? So, 
basically not too many options. Actually, the last argument was not quite needed, but anyway, it's true. So it's fine. So uh, the only thing this could have been as an operator statement is a times curvature scalar. And now we've got found some fancy ways to determine weights. Up to minus signs that I need. Okay, but he can have it. If you have a, in, in a theory, you know that you can have some fluids which you get their form of give this definition. Is it possible? Uh, well, you would have to do it in a way that uh, um, that uh, was zero in flat space. Okay? So you see, the curvature scalar already is the lowest dimension scalar. Okay? That uh, uh, has dimension two. If you add additional things, you only get higher dimensions. You could try to do something with fields that without the state curvature scalar, but then you get a non-zero answer in that space. Okay? So basically there are no other, there, are, there are essentially no other options. Okay, what I was getting at was is there any argument why this should be more like independent of even the theory? I can understand that it should be independent of the state. Right. But why is this true for you know, all theories? I mean, with what do you see being over uh, You see, once we've argued that it's of this form, then we have a derivation that this parameter is C. Okay, so there's not much more to say about that. The important question is why is it of this form? And then we just see what else will it be. Now, you might ask, you see, there's, there's probably something better to say about this is in the end is a common Okay, I have the feeling that this is not the best answer to your question. Uh, but but I don't want to risk say something inaccurate here, so let me let me stop. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's something more to say. Well, okay, let's discuss this afterwards. Okay, look. Um, uh, other questions, comments? Okay, great. Now there's one last thing that I wanted to talk about. There's one last thing that I wanted to talk about um, that was general to conformal field theories in general before going out to study the specific conformal field theory of the uh, free scalar field. And this last thing is this Cardi formula uh, that uh, many of you would have heard of, and that's very, very simple, but also very interesting. Okay, so suppose we consider a conformal field theory. Suppose we consider a conformal field theory on a torus, the partition function of conformal field theory on a torus whose space dimension is negative pi and whose time dimension is negative. We did this partition function in Euclidean space. So though I call one of the direction space in the upper one time, these two things are completely equal. Okay? Uh, but simplicity now I focus on uh, conformal field theories with no fermions in them, so we don't have to worry about boundary conditions. There's an extension of what we say. Fermions will not get to that. Uh, let's be simple. Okay. And now, suppose. Uh, uh, the first thing I want to remind you of is that this partition function has has a simple interpretation in Hilbert's space language. This is simply equal to the trace of e to the power minus beta h. Trace of e to the power minus beta h of the theory, uh, where h is the Hamiltonian of the theory, uh, h is the Hamiltonian of the theory. Difficult to know what the exact answer to this 
partition function calculation is that um, you know, given this, uh, given this, uh, uh, again, given this interpretation, again, okay, one can easily compute what this partition function is in the limit of very large beta. Why is that? See, because in the limit of very large beta, this partition function is dominated by the lowest energy state in this here. But we've already seen that in any unitary conformity theory, the lowest energy state is the state due to the vacuum. And it has energy zero in the plane, but that translated to L0 and L0 bar both equal to minus C by 24. And therefore, energy which is L0 plus L0 bar equals minus C by 12 on the cylinder. Right. We saw that, you see, the vacuum is scaling dimension zero. But there was a shift between energies on the cylinder and scaling dimensions on the plane. The shift was by a factor of minus c by 24 for L0. Similarly, there's a shift of minus c bar by 24 for L0 bar. C bar is the right moving center. Let's assume that c is equal to c bar. This is one of these different forms in the Okay, So you get a total shift of minus c by 12. Um, uh, uh, minus c by 12 in n naught plus n Okay? So the lowest energy state of the theory is vacuum, it's unique, and its energy is minus c by 12. Okay? So when we pass large, we have uh, this, this partition function. Again, and this approximation means we're dropping the terms are exponentially suppressed in e to the power minus beta, but this coefficient is accurate. So one times this, because this is a unique constant. The degeneracy is one. Okay, good. So far, so good. All that we've said is that at very low temperatures, the partition function is dominated by the back. Who didn't know that? However, now let's look at this. Let's look at this. Uh, um, now let's take this this uh, 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 this partition function. Now let's take this partition function and uh, uh, view it slightly differently. You see, let at first let me just take this torus and flip it around in my mind. Okay, so it becomes a torus. One of the sides is beta here. And the sign here is 2 pi. See, I'm going to pass the angle torus, which I call the x side and which I call the y side. It's totally up to me. So, this is also the answer to that. Now, I do the next crucial step. Okay. I realize that by a scale transformation, I can shift this to a torus which then is 4 pi squared divided by beta and 2 pi. Merely by performing a, conform, a, a, a wire rescaling, which is everywhere uniform. Because of uh, performing a uniform wire rescaling, the partition function of my theory does not change. We just derive that. All changes uh, appear with derivatives of that. Del squares of the wire factor when you perform a, a wire transformation. Okay, okay? So this partition function of this theory the same as partition of function in this theory, and therefore is the same as part. So we have that z of 4 pi four and this is 2 pi squared. 2 pi squared by beta. Is equal to e to the power c beta by 12 when beta is very large. But the, all these manipulations are exact. But we only know the answer to this when this side is the is, a, is true. 
so, so, okay, but this statement is significant. You already said that there's a low temperature high temperature. Exactly. Okay. Yes, yes. You see, that is right. It's just a property of the bath. That's right. Okay. So that z, that z. So Lagrangian point was that this, we already made a statement z of beta is equal to z of two pi squared by beta. This is an exact statement. That's true. Okay. But we only know the left hand side of the Okay? Fine. So, now let's rewrite this in terms of the argument of this, this one. So let's define beta prime equals 2 pi over oh, squared by beta. Huh? Okay, so we will find beta prime, which is 2 pi over x squared divided by beta. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then substitute this in. Uh, substitute this in uh, to this expression. So what do we get? We get uh, uh, z of beta prime is equal to e to the power c by 12 beta prime and then divided by beta prime we've got a 2 pi squared up as we need a uh, by 2 pi oh have I got 2 pi squared on? sorry I got that, got that. Okay, beta, beta prime divided by 2 pi squared is 1 And this now holds a no beta. Okay. So the log of the partition function, the log of the partition function is equal to c pi squared by 3 beta prime. Or do you have to the interpret beta prime as an inverse temperature is equal to c pi squared by 3 into the temperature. Okay? So the free energy of the theory, which is minus t times log of the beta function, is c pi squared by 3 t squared minus. Theory, you can compute both the entropy density okay, and the energy density. Okay? And I'll leave this as an exercise for you, but I want you to show that up to some numbers, in this form, this formula tells you that you've got C times some number times the, the entropy density of the theory scales like the square root of the energy times the square root of C times some number, which follows immediately from here. And so on. Okay, so what we've done, what we've done is use the central charge to compute the rate of growth of states in the theory at high energies. Okay, so you see this is another interpretation of the central charge. Uh, it's an interpretation that makes clear that the central charge tells you how much stuff you have in your theory. More precisely, it tells you how fast your, the density of states in your theory goes with energy. Okay. Theories with larger central charges have more degrees of freedom. As you see most clearly from here, the free energy is function of temperature is proportional to the central charge. So if you have any non-interacting fields, the free energy is any type that fill. See it's like number of degrees of freedom. Also, I assume that when C is less than one, we have That's so small C is Few, a few states. Okay, so uh, we come this again a rather general conclusion that has used a very little input. The input it has used is unitarity. It's used unitarity in concluding we know the energy, the lowest energy state. Okay, 
happens here is just modular invariance. It's just a fact that the torus partition function is very high. You know, provided that you have done your the probability theory is defined by often taken on some on torus. Uh, you know, so it's just a very uh, given basically very few requirements. We've got a very powerful conclusion of immediately. Okay, so now we've got many different ways of thinking of the central charge. The central charge is that object that governs the density of states of the theory at high energies. It's that object that tells you how the theory, the partition function of the theory changes uh, after a wide transformation. It's that object that tells you what the trace of the stress tense is uh, in a theory, a theory in an object. Okay, it's that object that tells you how, how the stress tension ch changes under a wide Okay, so there are many different roles that the central charge plays. They're all linked to each other in this beautiful way. Okay, uh, so y y y you see that the central charge is an extremely important number uh, that characterizes this component. Okay, uh, okay. unless there are questions or comments, that's uh, it for my general discussion of the probability theory. Uh, I want to now start the discussion of the free scalar theory. Uh, in detail to flesh out some of these ideas, also because we're going to need this theory uh, a lot. Questions or comments? Okay, so now let's move on to a study of a particular conformity theory. We started with a very trivial one, yet one that is extremely useful in the study of string theory, namely the theory of free scalar fields. So this is the theory that appears in the world sheet of the string, as we saw in our first few lectures. And this action, as you remember, uh, was S is equal to 1 over 4 pi alpha prime, integral square root of G delta al alpha x mu delta x mu G alpha beta. And as in our study of string theory, we will mostly focus on this conformity of theory uh, on the background metric G. Flatless. Okay. So the first thing that I want to I, I, I want to understand. So what's the part of the, the action of our theory? The partition function of our theory is exponential of minus the actions minus one by four pi, right? Square uh, del alpha x mu. And let, let me, since we've got a bunch of decoupled conformity theories, one for each mu, uh, to start with, I'm starting the theory with just one x. Okay. It easily had copies of it. Okay. <laughs> now, the first thing I want to do is to derive the Green's function. For all these free for all the free scalar fields of this theory, um, you know many ways to do this. Okay, uh, anyone who's familiar with studying quantum field theory knows many ways to do this. I'm going to use you know search get all factors right, and then give you a uh, and uh, a first principles derivation using as we will always try to do in this course a path in there, you know, path in So, what is the green function? The Green's function is the value you get when you add the equation of motion del, del, del square for the master string state of field on the two-point function of the field. Okay? Now, you get something non-zero only because, as usual, you have to study what you can Because the field is obey the equation of motion. So you might think, why, when, when I act del square on a two-point function, why don't I just get zero? It's the same as the discussion we had for uh, uh, for the current, exactly, the current conservation. You don't get to zero because you act on delta functions of time ordering this way. Okay? So, what we want to do is to try to understand uh, how the equations of motion act on correlation functions. Now, yeah. Fine. So, let's see. What is the equation of motion? The equation of motion is the derivative of the action with respect to some field. Okay? So, let's first try to understand why the equation of motion is true, at least as an appropriate expectation. Okay? That, that is true, it's obvious. It's obvious from the fact that the integral of a total derivative is zero. 
So consider the following. Consider a integral of del by del x at some sigma of e to the power minus 1 by 4 pi alpha, right? Uh, del alpha x, del alpha x. This should be zero as long as the path integral is well defined. This should be zero because the integral of total derivative. We shouldn't have boundary terms to the far away infinity. Okay? But now let's compute all this. So this zero is equal to this. Now let's take the derivative. So we get the exponential once again, so integral of e to the power minus 1 by 4 by alpha prime del x squared times One by two pi alpha prime. There are two minus signs. The minus sign here and the minus sign that I get when uh, uh, doing integration by parts. <coughs> del square of x. That's it. Okay. So our first conclusion is that if there are no other operators inserted, at least no other operators inserted at the point sigma, then. Okay, so we could have a, any a number of operators inserted here, O1, ON, as long as the insertion points of these operators are not same. Okay? Then, uh, as a, then this manipulation will go through, we get O1 for ON, because in differentiating this, the derivative doesn't act with O1 to ON, it's local, it's a local function of, of the field x of sigma, uh, and the insertion point is not, so not sigma. Okay, very good. So we concluded that the uh, uh, that the correlation function of the equation of motion with any other operator is zero, provided these operators are not on the same point. So that's the that's statement that, that as an operator equation, the equation of motion is true. But we haven't yet got what we get out of this delta function, the time ordering delta function differentiation, and I'm from this point of view. So now let's be a little more careful. Let us look at uh, Uh, let's look at a particular case. Let's look at the case where we have where we had okay, delta by delta x of sigma. Then we have x of sigma prime, e to the power minus minus s. We have x of sigma prime, and then O1 to O n, such that all these other operators, such that all these other operators uh, are not coincident with sigma, but x of sigma prime could be a so now what do we get? We get two terms. The first term we get is delta of sigma plus sigma, minus sigma, right? That's equal to power minus s x over one to n. And the second term we've already evaluated. So let's write it as delta of sigma plus sigma, right? From minus sigma, right? Plus uh, 1 by 2 pi alpha prime del square of x of sigma, x of sigma prime. All of this inside the integral. This is equal to zero. This is clear? Okay, very good. Clear to everyone? Okay, great. So, uh, we've concluded that as, you know, as an operator statement, okay, uh, del squared of 2 pi alpha prime times well, x of sigma x of sigma prime and any number of other operator insertions as long as they are not coincident with sigma prime is equal, uh, is equal to minus delta of sigma minus sigma prime and the option. You can forget about correlation part of one, this is just an operator statement. Because the N D the reason that we aren't going to allow the other operators to be bang on top is why what other delta functions? This is a non clear statement, this is true. Okay. Now what? Now what? So um, uh, now if we want to do, we can use this to compute expectation value of x of sigma, x of sigma. 
Because we know that delta squared by 2 pi alpha prime of this is equal to minus delta sigma x, right? We also know that this thing is translationally invariant, and so it depends only on the difference of uh, uh, sigma and sigma prime's rotation invariant, blah, blah, blah. So it must be uh, some function that is that depends on modulus of sigma and sigma prime. Okay? This is the usual green function problem, and we've already in this class solved the problem. Okay? We know that uh, uh, the solution to this is simply log r alpha prime minus alpha prime alpha. Right, because delta squared and log r gives you 2 pi, cancels this, the alpha prime cancels this, and the minus sign is the minus. Okay, now it's more convenient to write this in terms of z and z bar. So instead of r, we write z and z bar, but that's r squared, so we need to by 2. of two point functions of operators is given by minus alpha prime by two log of z and z. Well, I mean, this is z minus w times z minus w. <coughs> is this clear? Okay, very good. So that's our first calculation of this theory. It's a very important calculation. It's one that we will use on the time. Okay. Now the next question we're going to ask is what is the stress density? As we know, the stress density is very important role in in uh, in Okay, so we've already computed this. Right at the beginning, when we doing string theory, remember the stress density was simply the constraint equations. And you remember that it's del x, that the tzz is del x, del x, tzz bars. That bar. Huh? It just simply consistent with the dimensions we've done to get the constants, right? Okay? And uh, I'm not going to go, go through a check just to tell you that the right value is t is minus 1 by alpha prime, del x, del x, and the similar formula for x bar. Okay, if you trace through the definition of what the stress tensor was and apply it to this action, this Now, the first question that you might have in your mind is what is this mean? What does this mean? Because, you know, what, why in the quantum field theory, um, an operator which is linear to the field that makes a lot of sense, bilinears don't make so much sense. Because you have short distance singularities when operators come together. Okay? So before proceeding with that discussion, before proceeding with that discussion of. So, as is generally true in, in the standard quantum field theory, whenever you deal with composite operators, namely operators that are made out of product, are products of basic fields, you need to define what you mean. Okay. You need to define what you mean because if by a composite operator you just meant phi and x plus phi and x plus epsilon, limit epsilon goes to zero, insert it into the path integral, the answer to that question is infinite, almost infinite. Because of the short distance singularity in phi x meeting phi x values. Okay. So, insertion of that quantity into a path integral makes no sense. So by operator, we need an insertion of a path integral. And if I really meant, really said, uh, you know, literally meant to insert this at the same point, or more precisely, insert it, you know, in the limit of the points goes to zero, the difference between the points goes to zero, I would just get nonsense. You're getting it. That insertion is not going to how do I know that in such a statement? Right? Well, I know it from here. See, we've already computed that if we take x and x prime, okay, and we, we look at the uh, vacuum expectation value of that, that object, it has a singularity when the two points come together. Okay? Uh, and then if I look to two derivatives here, this log singularity will become a 1 over z squared singularity. Yeah, so that's a pretty bad singularity. Okay? So, by this object, I certainly don't mean, I certainly don't mean just inserting these 
this expression into the bottom. Right? So what do I? Well, this is always an inside quantum field theory level question. What you have to do basically is to define a well-defined insertion into the power. Uh, often one uses dimensional regularization and sophisticated techniques to define these operators. However, the case at hand, because it's a free field theory, there's a very simple thing we can do. And very simple thing is essentially normal. Okay? Now, normal what I'm going to do is is basically normal ordering, but also carefully dealing with the zero ones. See, normal ordering is an, an unambiguous prescription for oscillators, but uh, it won't know how to deal with zero ones of the problem. Yeah, there's an ambiguity of how to deal with zero ones. So what I'm going to define for you is a, is, a, is operate how to how make sense of operator insertions in a method method that, that, method that is more or less normal ordering for those of you who know which theorem. That. But uh, if you don't, if you never heard of normal order, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to define it for you, and we use that definition consistently. Okay, so I'm going to define the new symbol. I'm going to define, suppose we have x of sigma times x of sigma prime. I'm going to define this symbol which consciously calls conformal normal order, right? Essentially, a slightly souped up version of normal order that deals also with zero ones. Okay? And that is equal to x of sigma, x of sigma, right? Minus, back to make, minus this one. Okay? What do I mean by this? By this I mean whenever I put this insertion into the path and table, the thing I actually put in the path and table is this one. Okay, now the first thing to notice, the first thing to notice is that the equation of motion is a true equation inside conformal motion. Why is that? Well, if I have del square and x of this, I get something non zero here and something non zero here, but the two non zero things cancel, more or less by construction. operator product. You know, if you try to use the equation of motion naively on uh, uh, path integrals of operator itself, you get it. That's wrong because you're not taking account the delta functions. But what, when I do it with normal order operator insertions, what I'm doing is correct. Is this clear? So, something very nice that follows from this immediately is that this quantity because the equation of motion applies to it, that tells you that del squared of x uh, of sigma times x of sigma prime is equal to zero, which tells you that this normal order product is a genuine analytic, well, genuinely in sum of an analytic and anti-analytic function in the argument of x. You see, if the factor was not zero, not quite zero to allow singularity. Yeah? Okay? Uh, uh, this would be clearer if I have. Well, okay. Uh, let, me, let me do it on del x, del x, del of x prime. If I now act with del bar on this, I simply get zero. I honestly get zero. Okay? I honestly get zero. And therefore, uh, del x, the cor correlation functions of del x, inside normal order expressions are genuinely analytic expressions in the point of insertion of index. Okay? So that yep. okay, so that tells us that if we have an expression which is normal ordered and we try to expand you know, some correlation function that's normal ordered and we try to expand the correlation function in uh, one of the arguments of the operators we we'll only get analytic terms and no singularities. Is this clear? Okay. Okay, so it's a very important point. Okay, so I'm only different. Yeah. Okay, you see, we've said that the, op that the equation of motion is a genuine equation inside normal motion. Okay? Act of 
del x. So del bar of del x is just zero inside of the object, okay? which means that the correlation function as a function of the insertion point of del x is an anti is an analytic function of that insertion point. It's a genuine analytic function. Okay, but that is true only when it is non orthogonal. When it's not. So inside normal ordering, the correlation functions of inside normal ordering are genuinely analytic functions of, of del x inside normal ordering. But in general, when we write the correlation functions, we will not have normal ordering for that. That's correct. But the statement I'm making is for normal. Okay? And therefore, such correlation functions are analytic functions of the insertion points of the of the of the operator. When you open the exam. And cannot have singularities. Okay, let's continue. You see, uh, we, def we define normal ordering as a product uh, of, of a product of two operators. Okay, by the way, now any number of derivatives of x is just defined the same way. And you, you perform the same derivative operation on the on the subtraction. On the subtraction. Uh, in a way, you don't really need to define normal ordering or derivative of x. Because derivatives are just differences between between these two insertions. So once you know how to deal with insertions of x, you know how to deal with insertions of derivatives. Okay, so, fine. Now, uh, what if we have a, a product of three x's? Okay. x, x, x of sigma 1, x of sigma 2, x of sigma 3. Okay? Uh, the normal order, uh, okay. I'm going to define normal ordering by the following recursive expansion. I'm going to define normal ordering by saying that this is equal to f x normal order x of sigma 1, x of sigma 2, x of sigma 3, plus x of sigma 1, normal order x of sigma 2, uh, sorry, plus uh, x of sigma 1 uh, times contraction well this is big scale but it's, it would be big scale if we had an independent definition at the moment it's my definition yeah but, but it's, it's, it's a definition that agrees with big scale okay plus x of sigma 2 times Oh, you, you think, okay, you're not defining normal ordering for any operator like above. I've just defined it for product of two operators. Yeah, I mean, you have defined it in terms of the oscillators. I mean, this is just a definition. Had you defined it in terms of the oscillators and then right. like this, it would have been the. It would have been the same. Exactly. You see, this was a definition for what it means to insert normal order of product of two x's. That, uh, what, uh, three operators of what? This is the definition. Sorry, what you were suggesting an alternative definition? That, that, then why can't we just define the normal ordering of three operators? Huh? Or also as, you know, like that minus. That, that minus. No, then you won't get rid of. Oh, oh, that minus back from expectation that you both do. Then you want to get rid of all singularities. Okay. So you want to get rid of singularities even when two operators come near to each other and one is far away. This, that, that won't do it. Okay, you want an expression which is totally non zero and therefore makes sense to insert into Okay, so what we've done here does that for you. You see, what we define is you take it, right? And then what it does is separate out the singularity from two operators coming nearby times this operator, which is where, where it is. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is our definition of uh, normal. This Recursive procedure defines what we mean by normal order expression of three operators. Same thing is going to go through for n operators. Okay? So by normal order, if you've got a product of n operators, you expand that in sum over all contractions times whatever is left behind. 
Now, some of our contraction pairs times whatever's left behind normal order, and so on. Is this clear? I'm not saying it very clearly. You understand what I mean? So, uh, let me say it again. Suppose you have the product of n operators, just the ordinary product. Okay? Uh, by my definition, this, this product is equal to normal order product of n operators plus normal order product of n minus 2 operators times contraction of the remaining 2 operators with a sum taken over all possible permutations. Plus normal order of n minus 4 operators times contractions of 2 operators in pairs with sum taken over all possible permutations and so on. Okay? That is my recursive definition that def defines what normal order of n operators because having defined this at n minus two, I already knew what n minus what it was by n minus two. So this equation has only one undetermined element. Maybe the guy that's no no. Okay, is this clear? I'm still going to write a formula for what this normal order operator is, but, but just uh, the, this is generally the most convenient way to calculate rather than use a formula. Uh, so you should understand what the definition is, you know, intuitively rather than it's a formula. Okay. So this is my definition of normal object. I'm going to take the following exercise for you. Exercise. Check that with this definition of normal ordering, okay, the equation of motion holds inside normal ordering for an arbitrary product of operators, not just product two operators. The equation of motion holds as a genuine equation. And therefore, for instance, uh, inside normal ordering, the, uh, uh, the correlation functions of del x are genuinely analytic. Okay, uh, are generally analytic um, inside an arbitrary normal order. Okay, now uh, these words may sound a little confusing. It's always nice to have an equation uh, to replace words in a definition. So uh, the 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 words that I just said uh, can be written down in the following equation. Suppose I've got some operator O, some product of operators, this is not necessarily local, it's product of operators at x1, x2, x3, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I want to define, uh, I want to expand that in a normal order uh, series. Okay, so what do I do? What I do is, what I have to do is to, um, What I have to do is to take this two-point function and subtract it for every contraction. Okay? Now, so the two-point function was minus alpha by two log of uh, mod z squared. So the subtraction of the two-point function is plus alpha prime by two log of z one minus z two the whole thing squared d two z one d two z two. Okay? And let's put. Delta by delta 